Good morning. I'm Shailesh Prakash, Chief Information Officer at the Washington Post. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a series of discussions about artificial intelligence, technology that's changing the way we work and live at an exponential rate. Um, our speakers, who come from government, the private sector, and the advocacy community, will look at current and future applications of AI that have the potential to revolutionize our society, from the face recognition software on your digital devices, to the integration of fully autonomous robots into everyday life, and talk about how we ensure AI is used responsibly across industries and in our communities. Here at the Washington Post, we are big believers in technology and have embraced AI. Let me read an article from Wired Magazine about one of our products. And this is an article, I'm just gonna quote it uh, from Wired. When Republican Steve King beat Democratic challenger Kim Weaver in the race for Iowa's fourth congressional district in November, the Washington Post snapped into action, covering both the win and the wider electoral trend. Republicans retained control of the House and lost only a handful of seats from their commanding majority, the article read. A stunning reversal of fortune after many GOP leaders feared double-digit losses. The dispatch came with the clarity and verve for which Post reporters are known. With one key difference, it was generated by Heliograph, a bot that made its debut on the Post's website last year and marked, and this is them saying it, not me, and marked the most sophisticated use of artificial intelligence in journalism to date. That's a story on Wired.com from February of 2017. So Heliograph has evolved and gotten better since then. Now before you start thinking that all the great content on the Washington Post is actually written by machines, <laughs> we use Heliograph in a fairly limited content where in fairly limited um, scenarios, and it creates content in areas where there's a lot of structured data. Uh, election results, sports scores, real estate, earning reports, and so on. It certainly is not capable of writing the great articles and analysis pieces that our talented journalists like Brian Fung write. Uh, well, at least not yet. Other examples of what we have built using machine intelligence here at the Post range from ModBot, an algorithm that helps us moderate the millions of comments we get on our site every day. And Mark Zuckerberg, if you're watching, I'm happy to sell ModBot technology to Facebook uh, to help you weed out all the fake Russian accounts in preparation for the 2020 elections. Uh, we'll probably take that payment in cash and not in Facebook stock, but that's a separate story. <laughs> Separate story. <laughs> we have also built uh, what we call a virality predictor. Uh, this helps predict if a story is going to go viral by considering a variety of factors. Now, there are some obvious factors, social shares, the traffic that the story gets, and so on. But also there are other factors, like the author, the type of headline, the type of content, that this uh, algorithm analyzes to then predict if a story is going to be very popular or viral. And this helps us double down on that story by making sure that it's promoted on our homepage, that we push it out to as many outlets as possible and do everything we can to double down on the fact that we think that this story is going to be big. Uh, Virality Bot has become quite good. Uh, for those of you who practice algorithms for a living, typically when you increase the precision of an algorithm, the recall of that algorithm begins to drop. Or if you increase the recall, the precision begins to drop. We have over time been able to do a reasonable job to increase both precision and recall so that it gets the stories that are going to go viral or popular right and also reduces the times that it gets stories that are not going to go popular and label them as popular. So both precision and recall are pretty good. One proof of that is that <clears throat> despite Heliograph's uh, great attempts, Virality Bot has accurate, accurately predicted that none of Heliograph's stories are going to go viral. So we are working on that as well. <laughs> 
And my favorite project that we are hard at work currently in partnership with Google is trying to determine a user's propensity to subscribe. Uh, this is an aspect of personalization that's very important to publishers like us who want to provide a frictionless path for our readers to subscribe. And our early results in that area are quite encouraging. I'm a believer that the world we live in will be fundamentally, and I mean fundamentally, different in the next 50 years. At the dinner table, I talk to my kids about the fact that I think that they will see changes in their lifetime that no previous generations of humans have seen. We have so many great sessions here today, including one called Utopia or Dystopia, which is such a fascinating topic. Will AI usher in a world where diseases like cancer have been eradicated? Uh, hunger and poverty are no longer an issue. We have solved interplanetary travel and nations live in peace? Or will it drive us into a dystopian nightmare, which, as Elon Musk puts it, is like summoning the devil? I'll leave you with that conundrum playing in your minds. So now let's get the real experts on stage. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank you uh, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsors for today's program, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, and our supporting sponsor, the University of Virginia. And now, please welcome to the stage the Washington Post's Brian Fung, the irreplaceable Brian Fung, former Chief Technology Officer of the United States, Megan Smith, and members of the U.S. House of Representatives, Pete Olson and Robin Kelly. Thank you. I'm Brian Fung, a technology reporter here at the Washington Post. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we've got a fantastic panel lined up today uh, with uh, Megan Kelly, uh, former CTO of the United right. States. Yeah. And, um, I'm sorry, Megan Smith. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> different Megan. I'm an engineer. I don't know if I'd be so good on you know, um, talk shows. Uh, and uh, the, the head of Shift7, which is yeah. an organization that connects entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, yeah. uh, all, Tech forward innovation. Yes, yeah. all around the world. Um, Congressman Pete Olson, uh, who is the Artificial Intelligence Caucus co-chair. And uh, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, who's the chair of the House Technology Accountability Caucus. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks very much for joining us. Um, just as a reminder, you can all uh, submit questions. I've got a little uh, tablet here um, using the hashtag post live. And um, to kick things off, uh, you know, I just figured I'd ask, since it's relatively uh, relevant, um, you know, how long is it going to be before I'm out of a job? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, we, we sent a memo to President Obama uh, when we were working on the AI reports um, about what is happening in AI, and one of the things it said is, you know, narrow AI is here. You know, we see self-driving cars and vision and these kinds of things. Generalized AI, probably a couple decades. He said, uh, he, he wrote back, that's not too long from now, let's get ready. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, Elon Musk, we were talking about yeah, Stephen yeah, Hawking yeah, yeah. those things. Uh, you know, it really is the challenge of our time. And, uh, and I believe that the opportunity is really about collective genius and the surface area of participation. That the more of us that are involved in this and part of it, and not um, subjugated by terrorist like style uh, math, you know, learning and stuff. So we make everyone afraid of math in school, except a few who make through. But the more of us who can be included in the conversation, the more likely we are to succeed. One of the biggest findings of the research was that we don't have enough AI. Yep, yep, yep. We have AI applied to self-driving cars and precision medicine and you know, robotics in certain sectors. Uh, clearly, we're doing it with social media, and we have some weaponization going on with the election tech and other kinds of things. But we're really not applying it. I mean, why would AI and data science not be for poverty and justice? You know, why wouldn't it be for equality? Um, and I'm going to show you some images later a little bit about that. But, but it's, and you guys are, you know, we're really helping us broaden out into that. So I think it's not about the founder of AI, most people have never heard of because history erases a lot of uh, 
women, but uh, Ada Lovelace, anybody ever heard of Ada Lovelace? So when Darwin wrote his paper on the origin of the species, the history of us, Ada also wrote a paper at the same time, 55 pages, about the future of us. You know, the first algorithms are in that paper. She's Lord Byron's poet, math daughter in that rural society when Frankenstein was written around the same time. <laughs> You know, and she wrote about how we would be with, how, how this could help us. It wasn't imitation, let's fake you out, let's trick you, uh, which came later with Turing about 100 years later, and he refers to Lady Lovelace. So I think it's interesting to think about what is it we want to do. And you know, sometimes we talk AI for good, well, is all the other AI for greed? Like, <laughs> let's like make AI, you know, Nat Geo just announced AI for Earth. What can we do to include everyone? Can we add data science? We were talking about children at school. You know, can we get all of our kids into computer science for all? Wyoming has it, other people have it, that kind of work. So mm -hmm. I think it depends is the answer yeah. on us. And it's 100% in our control if we have the will. Congressman, do you want to reflect on that? Great news, Brian. Rob and I have great news for you. You will have a job, yeah. a better paying job, different job for sure, but a better paying job because of AI. Yeah. And that's our challenge. There's lots of fear. This is big time change and big time change causes fear. Yeah. And there will be job losses for sure, transitions. Not losses, but transitions. For example, who's heard of Big Blue? IBM. Their business when I went to Clear Lake by NASA was big mainframe computers, these massive computers. And they made chips, basically hardware. They do none of that right now, they've transitioned. And those people working in those positions have jobs still in the new IBM. Another example, Amazon.com. They're embracing AI. But to train people in their new jobs, they keep them there in-house. Mm -hmm. Great. Say, hey, listen, your job's going away? Sure. We'll keep you here. We train you. Oh, by the way, after you're trained up with AI, you'll be more productive. You'll work less. You'll work for eight hours and produce 16 hours of work. You'll be happier, better employee. It's our future. Embrace it. Either get on the train or get off the tracks because it's coming down. Congresswoman? I really think it comes down to preparation and anticipation. Mm -hmm. And then educating our children, but also in educating our children, have the mindset that you're, you're not going to keep this one job. Your job is going to change all through your life, not like my parents were in the same job. I've been in different jobs, not like what's coming ahead. And just that mindset that because of technology, AI, things are going to be constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even in this, you know, today's workforce, a lot of people switch jobs, you know, oh, every definitely. three to five years, and I mean, people have multiple jobs at the same time. So. Um, Megan, I wanted to return to something that you brought up um, in your remarks, which was, uh, you know, something I hadn't really thought about, which was, you know, how we make people afraid of, mm -hmm. of math. And um, certainly, you know, that was, that was the case when I was growing up. And um, so I just wonder, you know, what policies we need uh, or you know, what culture changes we need to help bring people into the fold when it comes to, to math and science. Yeah, the, the good news is uh, almost all these problems are solved in a specific way. And the question is, can we scale them? Like, for example, that's a Raspberry Pi, right? It's a, a cool little board. It's just like the board from your phone. You know, in England, all the kids are getting these. So what, how cool would it be if you were in kindergarten, first grade, you got one of these, and you're like, oh, okay, this is how I plug in my headphones, and here's how I put power. And uh, you know, this is what Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak had at the home brew, right, when they made Apple, but it was a little bigger. <laughs> uh, but really, like, how do we get more familiar and comfortable like the IBM folks and, and learn to make this a fluent thing just like you would read and write? So the good news is uh, Wyoming has voted already uh, that all children uh, from kindergarten will learn coding, computer science, and computational thinking fully deployed by 2023. You can learn, you can't graduate from high school in Chicago without learning to code. So the, this computer science for all uh, around all people, Muskogee Tree, Creek Tribe in Oklahoma teaches robotics and Head Start. So what we need to do is go find this great stuff that's already working, that's used budgets we already have, and help share rapidly, almost like community organize, you know, the teacher there. So that's good at that level. For the grown-ups, how do we get familiar? Um, there's a great program we started and it continues called Tech Hire. Uh, and it's really find the techies in town, 
uh, find these new boot camps. 23,000 Americans are going to graduate from Code Boot Camp this year. It's like a no collar tech. Uh, it's three months, not years, and you just get apprenticed into tech. And the great news is it's gone from two or three employers willing to hire from there to 1,500 and growing. I was just uh, in Memphis where we have 45,000 young people out of school and out of work in their 20s. Basically, what are they doing? Burning down the city. So instead of that, there's now, Mech and others have started Code Crew, and people are transitioning, including those sometimes coming out of prison or aging out of foster care or veterans or others, into the tech center sector where we have uh, Service Master. You know, we've got uh, FedEx. We've got, they're starving in Memphis, and they've got this employee base, but they haven't figured out how to route folks. Mm. So now 70 cities are doing this fast routing boot camp to work uh, for thousands of Americans and filling the millions of jobs we have uh, around the country in this sector. So it's exciting. Congresswoman, you were speaking a little bit earlier about how there's just a, a complete shortage of you know, talent and, and labor right. uh, for a lot of businesses in your district. My district is urban, suburban, and rural. I have the south side of Chicago, the south suburbs, and then I have 1,200 farms in my district also. But when I visit my employers, they say the same thing. We can't find enough people. People don't have the tech acumen. And it's not that they have to have a four-year degree, but that program is so important because I see you know, parts of the Chicago I represent have the gun violence issue. And if we could teach job skills and things like that, people will pick up, you know, pens, pencils, job skills, not guns. Mm. And uh, it offers such opportunities. So I, th I think it's so important to have programs yeah. like that. And Brian, one thing that Echo Robin's comments I'm seeing every day back home is there's been this notion for my whole lifetime, to be successful in America, you have to get a four-year degree, a BA or a BS. Otherwise, you can't succeed. We're seeing that changing. Local colleges like Alvin Community College, San Jacinto back home, Wharton College are stepping up and training people with good paying jobs that can pay good money for a lifetime. A few examples. Um, at San Jacinto, with a local school district, you graduate from high school, walk across your diploma, shake the superintendent's hand, come background, change gowns, get your AA in some skill from the college the same day. So you're going to the workforce, a good paying job with no debt. Your brothers and sisters in high school are going off to a four year college, hey, I got my degree, but I've got this big debt. Wow, I've got a beach house coming down the road because I've got so much money. And this is not just, these are high tech jobs. For example, south of my district, there's this nuclear power plant called the South Texas Project. Has two reactors, been up and running since 1979. You do the math, the guys working there from, from the get-go are now retiring. The local county judge who runs our counties in Texas said, one local college is Wharton County, help me retrain the workforce. And so these high school graduates are going to local college with no BA and running nuclear reactors. And we should embrace that as a big part of that because that makes that worker better, more viable, more efficient, drives down costs, drives up productivity. It's just great. Also, a big study from Price Waterhouse Cooper about a month ago, AI will add somewhere north of $17 trillion to the world's economy in 10 years. That's, there's only one country that has more than that GDP, that's America. That's more than China's GDP AI in 10 years. Embrace the change, embrace, embrace, don't be afraid. So I think this we have to start young though, because um, we have community colleges that have the, the graduate and work, or they work with the company, so the students have the job skills, but you know, we have to start in fourth, fifth, just to get people in that mm. mindset that mm. yes, you can do this. So this isn't strictly related to AI, but since we've been talking about it, I figured it's a, it's an interesting segue. You know, we have um, uh, a major issue in this country with the cost, the exploding cost of higher education. Yep. How do you see some of this educational shift uh, affecting that trend? Well, that's the issue for sure. And Congress has to address that as well. But the big thing, I started the AI caucus last Congress with a Democrat who's retired from, from Maryland, uh, John Delaney. And he's been replaced by Jerry McNerney from California. And guess who joined the caucus today? Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Robin. And basically, caucus is to make sure Congress gets in front of AI and not working from behind. 
as I mentioned, this is our future. It's scary, it's changed. As Megan mentioned, smart people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk have said AI can destroy society, mankind goes away, doom and gloom. They're smart people and they're afraid of change. We have to embrace a change and the caucus has a bill called the future of AI and Robin knows, listen, these are two words you rarely hear in DC, it's bipartisan, bipartisan <laughs> and bicameral. House and Senate with the same bill and all this bill does is say, hey Congress, take some time, put a panel together, look at how DC is doing, federal government, the AI, and make suggestions, improvements. And we hope to get that through, because again, it's bipartisan, bicameral, and let's get started quickly. Embrace the change, because this is the world's future. So I wanted to, to drill down a little bit on that question still. Uh, you know, how do we make higher education more affordable so that more kids can um, you know, take up uh, some of these skills or um, get involved in, in math and science? I mean, for me, I, I think it comes down to um, prioritizing what we think is important. And um, education is very important. You've used the term, you don't have to get new money just to rework the money. Yeah, dust off the budget. <laughs> dust off the budget. And I think that we have to serious look, seriously look at that. We have to look at um, our student loan program. Um, because that's an issue to the interest rates that uh, students are paying and um, also working with um, businesses to see you know can you sponsor mm -hmm. like in, like starting with internships so you're grooming and helping to educate the people that you're going to mm -hmm. eventually hire yeah. you know so I mean the government has some programs like that um, but you're right it's very expensive and some people don't even think about going to school, but I think we have to relook at the budget mm -hmm. because when you look at countries like China, the money that they're putting into education and research and development and all those things, well, we need to make sure we have people going forward that can do those things right, also. Right. We've spoken a lot about um, the promise of AI uh, so far this morning, but let's talk a little bit about the pitfalls and the potential biases that could be introduced um, and the kind of regulation or oversight that might be necessary uh, in light of that. Maybe, Megan, you want to start off? Yeah, I brought just a few images uh, to share with you guys to really illustrate this point, but you know, a simple example would be uh, the technology on the phone in your pocket it has a relatively racist camera, right? Because when you take photos of certain race people, you have to light balance it. So for example, uh, AI and machine machine learning face recognition doesn't recognize certain skin colors very effectively, like putting your hands under water and the light doesn't turn on. So that is really unacceptable. This is another really good example here if we bring it up. Um, this is interesting from Hollywood and it's showing you who gets to speak in, in the media we watch. And so we could have the AI look at all the media we had and make the same world, but do we want to make this world? Do we want to notice the problem and then invent something new? For example, this is children's TV. So men's lines to women's lines and children's TV, men in blue, women in red. So we're learning as children that women speak less than men. Is this what the society bias is doing in the media that children are watching? When we grow up, this is what we see, men's lines to women's lines in 2,000 films. Right, and so as we get older, men get more lines. When we get, we don't want to make that. So, for example, Jeff Bezos, of course, we're here at the Washington Post. They had some AI trained on hiring, and it started just hiring men because the tech industry is biased. So, we don't want to take our old biased world and just algorithmically make it more effective to disinclude some people and accelerate others. Um, and an example of what you can do about this, you know, here's Star Wars on the left in 1977 by gender and race in terms of who got to spoke. So Carrie Fisher's lines up there in yellow, and then Rogue One. It's interesting to show this to our Hollywood colleagues. They're like, wow, we thought we did better on diversity, but they didn't. So what could you do about it? The See the face recognition on the screen? Yes. So you can actually use, when we don't need the audio, but you could use the, uh, the face recognition, natural language processing like Alexa and Siri to actually analyze the dailies and the scripts as we're making them because our Hollywood colleagues don't mean to be biased. And so we're actually doing this and bringing it to clinical trials and working on that. So this is an application of AI in trying to make media more equal 
right? So that's something that we can, can give research funding to. And I just want to point out this point I was making, which is, you know, do you guys recognize these places in the desert? There are two of them. Anybody know where this is? Burning, burning. burning Man on the top. Bottom is Zatari refugee camp on the Syrian-Jordan uh, border in Jordan. They're governed very differently. Why are we doing that? You know, he, all, all this ability we have, we deploy the internet at Burning Man for a couple days. Why aren't we deploying the internet and letting the talent of Zatari lift itself out of the very difficult situation? You know, so, so many uh, systems are not using these great technologies, and yet we have those humans on the planet. We could rotate them. Just the last one I'll put out because I have my incredible Congress colleagues. This is bipartisanship that's changed over time because our media landscape and silos. And President Washington in the first State of the Union said, there's nothing which better deserves your patronage than science and literature. Knowledge is in every country is the surest form of public happiness. And so fake news knowledge, how do we get out of those media silos you know, that we're in and use AI for this comms technology, use AI for, you know, we were talking about precision agriculture. And, and I think one of the coolest opportunities is to bring data science into our high schools as one of the capstones like calculus and get the kids involved in data that they're interested in. Data science brings you to AI. And we all have biases. We're human beings. We're biased. For example, my bias came out this morning. My sweet friend here is from Chicago. <laughs> you might watch there's a football game that happened this past Sunday. Not good for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> okay. I assumed she would be upset. She lives there now, but she's from New York. She was happy. No, no. I was, <laughs> my, my husband might be watching. Don't say that. <laughs> But my point is, we all have natural biases, and that says human beings. And so when going forth with AI, and this I talked to the IBM people in Austin, Texas, which is now the Southwest Silicon Valley, that this project there called Watson, which is their AI prototype, and their big effort is to make sure our biases don't enter into the algorithms, because that's, we have to keep checking, checking, checking. Like I said, I thought, Bears fan, not a Bears fan. I'm working on a Texans fan, but that's going to happen later. But my point also is, bears fan. <laughs> you know, we talked a little bit about workforce and bias, and a big thing with me is the privacy issue because um, yep. privacy is really important. I, I guess because we're elected officials, and it feels like you don't have much privacy, but. Um, really respecting uh, individuals' privacy is very important. So I think that that's another area that we'll have to conquer to with regulations and how much, um, you know, people and entities and companies know about us, you know, and sometimes we don't even know how much they truly know about us and what's being shared. So a lot of your colleagues in the Senate have been thinking about, you know, what would need to go into a national privacy bill. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on what would be appropriate? Yeah, our Committee of Engine Commerce has jurisdiction, and guess who's on that <laughs> committee right now? Welcome, Robin. Thank you. Uh, the problem there, we had a couple bills, but not nothing got started because we had some bad, bad, bad things happen in our economy, big hacks. Lots of companies lost a lot of money, people were distressed, I've lost my credit card, my identity. We had some issues, these are data breaches. First of all, how do we define the breach? You remember Target three years ago was hacked terribly. Mm -hmm. The guys who hacked in there were there for three months. They came in, they found a little opening with a credit card, apparently slipped in there for a brief second. The window, the walls weren't up, they popped, they popped up after the card went in there. They got in there, probed around for a couple months. Here's information you want, just like a warehouse, move it over here and ship it out in small numbers. It took Target three months to find the breach. And so, when did that start? When they got in there, when you found it out? How, we've got to work to determine breach and privacy, I mean, this information is personal stuff. It can do real damage to an individual. If it's out there, you know, your health records, stuff like that. We gotta make sure DC, we take some time, but make sure this happens. And trust, work with the private sector. Encourage them, these breaches, we know bad things are happening. How come we can't share? our information with the private sector. There's a wall right now between us and private sector. Let's bring that wall down. Let them opt in to have briefings about threats across the world, because we know 
in the government more than private sector what's happening, where the bad guys are, what they're trying to do. Let's bridge that gap and help this economy grow. Again, this is our future, pure and simple. AI will be the 21st century America and the world. We have to embrace that. Just a couple of minutes left. Do either of you have any thoughts on uh, that question before, before we move on? Just my quick thing is, uh, um, we have a really interesting perspective that our personal self in the digital world is somehow property, not our self. And we really need to start thinking about our digital self and the ownership of us. Like we own ourselves, we own our thoughts. We should need to be digitally uh, uh, connected to ourselves and not have people selling us all around and have really rethink that architecture a little bit. The Europeans are doing an extraordinary job there, some of the South Americans. So if we need to follow that lead. Our, our congressional representatives are really uh, trying to take this up. Uh, which is great. It's the challenge of our time. Um, and so more transparency for the individual is really urgent. And then the only other thing is that we have Americans in our country who make all these systems. And we started to build structures with the US Digital Service, the 18F, the CTO team, and others to ask them to rotate into the most senior levels of government together with lawyers and operators and others. And so we need to keep doing that because it's these problems are harder than self-driving cars and precision medicine. They're, they're harder, they need a cross-functional team. And leaving the tech folks out of the room is a mistake. They don't know how to do it, but they know how to team up with people who know, and we can solve it together. Okay, lightning round, because uh, we've got just about a minute left. Uh, really great question from the audience here. How can local universities and their students participate in AI-related discussions happening on the Hill? Well, just get in touch with your congressperson, or like Robin, myself, and get engaged, for example, Congress now has a coding, little coding award. Every district encouraged to have a little coding. We, I went to Clements High School, gave them this big certificate, because these kids are amazing. They're coding, and high quality coding in high school. My high school was abacuses, and slide rules, <laughs> and fingers. These kids, and also robotics competitions. These things are amazing. These kids get so energized. And they're out there, these ro robots are doing amazing things. They learn technology, how to code. And so come out to Robin, myself, and get engaged. Also, as Megan said, push our schools. Teach these kids how to code as part of going to school. Great. Step up the plate, embrace the future. And also, um, I, when people come to my office, and we've had hearings uh, on different topics, and so I go back to those very people and uh, say, would you participate in a hearing? And I was sharing in my district, we started a STEM academy, so we had all those people at the table that you just talked about having to help guide us. So um, I welcome, uh, because I'm definitely not the expert, but I welcome yeah. schools, and also I wanna do everything I can to um, uh, enhance what our students can do and get them interested mm -hmm. in this field. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now. Um, thank you all so much thank for joining you. me. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. I am Bill Burnham. I am the Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Public Sector Business Unit of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. It's my privilege today to moderate this panel. This is an industry point of view, focusing on artificial intelligence and, and where it is and where, we, where we've seen it work and where the struggles are. Uh, most of us every day deal with artificial intelligence, whether we know it or not, in our mapping apps or in our recommendation apps for our streaming videos. Uh, unfortunately, when we get to our workplace and our organizations, a lot of times we don't see the benefits of AI. We don't. We don't, we don't get to feel uh, how, how much help uh, dealing with our data uh, could help our processes and our transformation and, and quite frankly, how we execute our business. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, with me on stage today are two experts. We have Bina Amanath, the Global uh, Artificial Intelligence Vice President for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, as well as Adi Basham. He is the Vice President for C3, which is a software artificial intelligence platform uh, that does a lot of great work. So we're gonna ask them some questions. They're gonna give us some of their, their points of view and it'll be a great conversation. I wanna first thank uh, the Washington Post for putting this on. Uh, this is great to be able to uh, bring a very important topic like this 
uh, and get the, the experts you've seen today and, and get the industry's point of view at the same time. So Bina, let's start with you. Let's, let's talk about your perspective of AI. You know, there's a lot of myths out there, realities. I mean, what's working, what's not working? Are customers really benefiting from artificial intelligence in the, in, in the real space? So I'm going to level set a bit. Um, because when we talk about AI, everybody has a different image about what AI means. So, you know, the way I think about it, just so that I, I have the context, and, um, you know, there's three types of AI. First is artificial narrow intelligence. That's a form of AI that can do a specific, very narrow task that a human being can do, like play chess. Then the next level is artificial general intelligence, which is what a form of AI that can do anything that a human being can do. And then the third level is artificial super intelligence, which is smarter than all human beings combined. And when we hear a lot of times about the hype and fear around AI, it's at the artificial super intelligence level. Sure. Whereas the reality is we are in the artificial narrow intelligence level which is where we are automating a lot of very specific narrow tasks, right? And to give, make it more real, like, you know, we could be sitting and playing chess here with AI, and AI would probably beat me, even though I'm a good chess player. It could beat me, but if this room catches fire, as humans, we will all run out and escape, but AI will continue to play chess. Right? Okay. So for me, that's, you know, that's the form of artificial intelligence we are at today. But at the same time, it's being used in real world today. Whether you look at it, it's not just about playing games. It's being used to automate a lot of the mundane tasks that we've been doing. It's being used to, you know, across industry sectors. Like we've done projects where we've used it to predict um, an outcome uh, from a specific use case b before it happens. We've used it to actually uh, look at uh, healthcare images and diagnose a disease early on. Okay. So it, it is being used very much in the artificial narrow intelligence phase. Adi, what about from your perspective? You're on the software platform side. You, you, you create artificial intelligence platform tools. Uh, what works, what doesn't work? Who, how are we implementing AI and, and, and doing good things with it? I think like both of you said, the uh, AI is everywhere as it relates to what I would call a B2C set of apps, right? maps and so on and so forth. In the set of organizations, whether it's the public sector or the um, enterprise space, I'd say AI is still in its infancy, meaning there is an overall awareness of what it is, uh, but I would say adoption is fairly early. Uh, it is, uh, like Bina said, limited to specific, so, so the way I think about AI is, uh, when done correctly, it gives an organization one of two superpowers. One is it gives you a million very good interns that can do anything very quickly. Right? Okay. Or it gives you one uh, superpowered intern who can do something extremely well, better than your entire organization. And it's one of those two, choose. Uh, the problem is you have to spend a fairly large amount of effort to uh, both train and deploy either superpower one or superpower two. Uh, and so where we've seen the most success, uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, in the public sector, we've been working with uh, uh, the, the US Air Force, and uh, if you play back to uh, the priorities of the DOD, one of them is to really improve uh, what, what they call readiness of mission critical equipment and platforms, right? And, okay. uh, and the goal is to get it up to like 80%. Uh, if you think about what that means, it means uh, being able to predict failure of equipment, being able to anticipate uh, where that particular piece of equipment is going to be. Uh, it means getting spare parts to the right with the and the right maintainers who have the right skills to that location before you're actually going to deploy any piece of aircraft or um, any piece of uh, uh, any platform that you might have. All of those things individually and collectively. Uh, are a combination of these two uh, AI capabilities. And, and, and when deployed fully, it effectively doubles the throw weight of the US Air Force, right? And, and, mm. and, and that sort of, um, <clears throat> it's both very impactful and also a very real world use of AI to solve a very specific problem. I'll give you another example from the private sector. Uh, we work uh, deploying these fraud detection systems for 
billing uh, uh, companies that have several customers, 40 million customers and 50 million customers. Uh, and the equivalent uh, public sector example would be like Medicare, et cetera, right? And, and so the idea is can you uh, find a way to build algorithms that can help the current fraud detection team triage better? Turns out with uh, the right set of algorithms, and with the existing set of t uh, people working in their current jobs, uh, one of our organizations has tripled the effectiveness of its people. So 200% so improvement or 3x overall gain uh, with no change in the workforce except a small reskilling. Right? Hmm. That, if you will, is where the most value and the most adoption will come from in AI in, in large organizations, whether they're public or, or private. So we're seeing success in, in narrow AI, in, in human-aided operation. So, so each of you have had engagement with people doing this and, and, and doing it well. What, what do you see as the hurdles? What, what's, the first, what's the bar to entry? How, what, where do people struggle so that our audience can, can better understand what, what they got to be ready for? Yeah, so what, what we've seen is, at least in our world, that 70% of uh, enterprises, organizations are just beginning to think about AI and starting that journey, right? And the two big hurdles that I see really, uh, what that has come up several times is, uh, one is organizational readiness, the culture, the willingness mm -hmm. to accept the new technology. Uh, and, and I struggle to understand it because we all use AI in our daily lives. AI is in all of your pockets or hands right now, right? Um, but when it comes to you know using AI in the jobs, um, it's, it, there's a fear that it, you're going to lose your job. Whereas I see it as a huge opportunity for all of us to do better in our jobs hmm. okay. by using AI, sure. right? And the, pro, uh, the proactive engagement of users will be what will help build the AI that is necessary to improve your jobs. Uh, the second one is really around policy. Uh, we don't necessarily have all the rules and regulations and laws figured out mm -hmm. to, um, uh, around you know, AI, and we're seeing that happening in right. the past few months. And that's, that's been true of any new technology in the past as well, as you, if you see, you know, it takes time for the technology to shape up to, for us to realize the impact and then start putting in the rules and regulations. So sure. you know, I think that parallel track has to start today for us to really succeed at AI. Okay, Adi, what about you? Hurdles, to, hurdles uh, to overcome to get AI started in your in your organization? I'd say three things overall that really um, hamper sort of these broader efforts, right? So, okay. the first is a genuinely true understanding at the leadership level of any organization of what AI can do and cannot do, um, and this is going past the hype of what the scary uh, impact of AI is, and really the uh, you really want leadership teams thinking through. Uh, where and in what aspects of the day-to-day uh, -day operation uh, AI techniques can be used and how. Uh, the second is a, the second hurdle, if you will, is to move um, from fixating on the cool to fixating on the useful. Uh, so uh, if the next time you kick off a bot project that like does something, uh, I always force our customers to answer the question, we got it, we'll solve it. What are you gonna do with it? Right? And if the answer is, well, we're going to write a white paper and put it on the website, I'm not interested. Right? Because it, 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 it generates no value whatsoever, uh, but it burns the organization because they're suddenly all swept up into worrying about uh, what's this bot going to do to my job. Right? Uh, and, and, and if you can't articulate how you're going to use a particular algorithm or a particular application or a particular use case to change something today, it will generate no value for you, and therefore will get abandoned. The third is uh, uh, trying to, uh, to Bina's point, either be in a hurry or uh, not have a set of uh, goals that you're going after. So what we try and shoot for is three months, 10x value. Right? If you can't demonstrate reasonably to a <clears throat> skeptical audience in the organization that uh, within three months that an app or a use case will generate disproportionate value to the cost it takes to put in, uh, you're wasting time because guess what? The person that's going to allocate time and resources to scale this out has got about 70 other things to deal with, right? And this one use case doesn't matter if it's, if it's not actually delivering value. Um, 
And I'd say if, when we hit these roadblocks, it's a sign that this thing will not scale um, inside an organization and more broadly. Mm -hmm. Well, great. So, so I think you hit on a couple of things that are critical, and I, and I expect a fair amount of folks in the audience, uh, a lot of our streaming uh, video visitors, want to bring AI into their organization. As a matter of fact, some of them probably have bosses that are, are telling them, hey, go, go get me some of that AI so that we can be more competitive, so that we can be more agile and faster at what we do and improve our process and better serve our customers. And so they're listening to us to say, okay, how do we get there? So, so is, is there a, a secret recipe for success? If you're going to tell an organization, hey, if you want to move into the AI landscape, these are the steps you follow. I mean, you focused on, on, on some of it, but could you go back through being a, what would you tell an organization? How do they get from where they are today mm -hmm. to getting or AI in their organization and, and, and returning value? Yeah, and uh, we follow a recipe, I call it the three E's Three of E's, AI. okay. Um, explore, experiment, and evolve. Okay. Um, because you, you won't believe the number of times we, uh, I'm approached on, oh, we have all this data with us. We should be doing AI. Or we must be, we have to do AI because we have data, or we must do AI because everybody else is doing it. And I think, uh, as Adi was referring, you know, it's very important to have that initial use case identified, especially when you're bringing in a new technology. You're going to invest heavily into it to right from setting it up. Um, so, you know, the experiment phase. Um, is really about you know identifying those initial use case and bil building out that proof of value and see how you know how it fits in your organization. How is the adoption? Are you really seeing the value? And sometimes it's the uncool stuff of you may not even have the data that's needed to build the AI. Um, so building that out initially, the use case that's really important, and then evolving it once okay. you get that buy-in. Uh, rolling it out to the organization, seeing how it's driving changes within the organization, how is it helping the company? That's that's where the real value is. Um, as for public sector employees, you know, it's really about being aware about the. Uh, what other governments are doing, what is going sure. on in other countries who are planning or implementing AI at scale. Just getting in a trusted partner who works with other public sector uh, or countries, that is so important for, um, for us to succeed. Sure, great. Adi, what do you think? I mean, what, what's the recipe for success for an organization bringing AI for the first time? Where do they go? Uh, I'd say, uh, a few things. One is you need uh, you, you need someone who is thinking value chain, not job, right? And when I, what I mean by that is, don't just imagine the world as it ends at your organization's boundaries, right? Imagine the world through everything that affects it and everything that you affect, okay. uh, in such a way that your landscape of what you want to do differently spans all of that, right? Some of it could be I need to go to everyone who sends me who supplies a base in, uh, in Arkansas and get information from every one of our suppliers because that somehow solves a use case, right? So think beyond the boundaries of your organization and think value chain uh, and think broad. Now, the second I would say is create a coalition of the willing between the builders of AI and the users of AI. And what I mean by that is uh, uh, the IT slash technology slash uh, vendor community that builds things versus the actual operational leaders that may or may not use this, right? And uh, if you do not have the coalition of those two parties, you will do things that are technologically cool, or you will come up with use cases that have no hope in hell of actually being deployed or built or, or, or scaled up, right? You, you get this complete mismatch. And you need to actually force that early and often. Uh, and then the third goes back to Bina's point, which is now that you've done the imagining and the visualization and brought all these people together, start with one tractable, valuable, complex use case and get it done. Right? And when I say tractable, I mean there's data, there is actually a problem to solve. It's valuable, meaning uh, you're not telling a, an aircraft maintainer to go uh, inspect the plane every two days, and that's the prediction because that's what he does anyway. Like, there's no incremental value whatsoever. Um, and complex, meaning it shouldn't be after the fact that after you've done all the work and the dust is settled, uh, that the person who's actually mm -hmm. buying this technology and using it says, 
wait, I could have just asked someone to do it without uh, without spending all this time and effort, right? It's, it's actually delivering value that is disproportionate to the amount of effort you put in. If you don't pick a use case, and this goes back to picking these uh, use cases very well, if you don't pick a use case that is tractable, complex, and valuable, you will then not be able to get the organizational momentum to go realize that vision of the cross value chain that you laid out the first time around. So that's what I'd say is think big, but start very, very specifically. Okay, so it sounds like you got to get some leadership buy-in, you got to commit as an organization, and, but the key is starting small, getting your toe in the water and, and showing success and, and value add to AI. Uh, from the industry point of view, we, we're building AI into everything. I mean, we build AI into our servers, into our storage and, and, and managing networks, et cetera. Uh, and I think what we've tried to show you here today uh, is that, that AI is real, it is, it is successful, uh, there are companies and organizations and public sector folks that we work with that are that are in, including AI in what they do and in their processes, uh, starting small for the most part and then moving up in narrow AI as being brought up. Uh, but they're starting to realize some of those benefits. And, and, and the first decision is to step forward, partner with folks, learn from others' use cases. Being brought up a great point that there are, there are other folks who have charted the path in front of us. Uh, but we believe and we're investing heavily in AI being really how we're going to change and, and benefit the way we live and work from Hewlett Packard Empire's perspective. We have a, uh, a bit of a demo expo center for the folks in the room here. I'm sorry the folks on the streaming video won't get to see it, but we have four or five different partners back there that are bringing AI platforms to bear for some of our customers, particularly in the public sector, and, and I invite you to go out and see that. And so moving forward, where we want to go, uh, you'll see some of the websites popping up on the screen. Uh, but, but there's a lot of information out there. Uh, you can go to these websites. You see contact information for both Adi and Bina. Uh, feel free to reach out to them directly, uh, whether that be Twitter, LinkedIn, or, or email direct. And, and we look forward to engaging uh, with you and helping you solve your problems. We appreciate the time. Washington Post, thanks. And I will turn the floor back over to the Washington Post. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for uh, sticking with us. Again, I'm Brian Fung, and uh, have another panel here for you that uh, is going to delve a little bit more into um, the ethical questions and quandaries surrounding artificial intelligence. Um, and joining me today, we have uh, Sherilyn Eiffel, who's the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, Kelly Trindle, who's the head of the diversity analytics um, for the hiring software company Pymetrics. And finally, uh, Miranda Bogan from Upturn, which is an advocacy organization aiming to make automated decision-making fairer. Um, so I want to start with Miranda. Uh, you know, you guys published a report recently talking about um, hiring practices using AI and what we're seeing right now in the marketplace. Can you talk a little bit about that? Fill us in. Sure, yeah. Hiring is one of those um, examples that people often throw out when they're talking about some of the problems and risks of AI. And we wanted to dig into that and really understand what type of decisions are um, being made with data in the hiring process. There's this conception that a robot maybe is making a yes, no decision, and it's really much more complicated than that. Um, automated systems like advertising platforms are used to help direct ads to people who are looking for jobs. Then there are job boards that are trying to match between people seeking jobs and to help recruiters kind of sift through potential applicants. This is before anyone's even applied to a job. And then you have, once people apply to a job, there are all sorts of tools that are trying to grade and assess candidates for how likely they are to succeed on the job. And then there are even some tools that are being used to um, optimize the offer to, to see how much would this person accept um, how to, to take this job. So data is really being used throughout the hiring process. AI is being used throughout the hiring process in really subtle ways. And it's really a cumulative decision. So there's not any one decision that's saying this person's hired, this person's not hired. And humans are often involved in different ways. And so I think it's really important to look specifically at um, tools that are being used and understand how they interface with human recruiters, with um, HR departments, advertisers, to understand what the impact of this technology is in a really high stakes context mm. that's determining who can access um, work and, and you know, financial uh, uh, prosperity in, mm -hmm. in their lives. Mm -hmm. Kelly, how many of these 
techniques are you guys you know, using or seeing um, you know, reflected in the work that you do? Sure, so the company that I work for, Pymetrics, actually is an example of a vendor that, that uses AI, computer science, for employment selection. And I know we're gonna get into it at some point, but there's a bunch of concern here about like potential bias and different kinds of issues like that. And that's actually why I joined this vendor. I'm not any kind of a salesperson, so I hope none of this sounds like a pitch, but I joined from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which obviously is the agency of the federal government that enforces civil rights laws when it comes to employment. And so I joined from the perspective of trying to make employment selection decisions better. Um, and so the particular company that I work for um, does the, we do basically matching. And so we look for like what is, what are the characteristics of a person who's successful in a particular position, and then how similar is each candidate to that sort of, for lack of a better term, profile of success. Um, and so that's the particular company that I work for. But before I left the EEOC, I did a lot of research about different companies and what they do in this space and what the pitfalls are. And I think the report that we were just hearing about does a really nice job, if you all have a chance to look at it, really laying out what all the different things are that are out there in this space. Mm. Um, you know, one way to look at this is that um, use, the use of AI in hiring um, could help employers optimize their workforces and uh, help them better achieve outcomes. Um, but Sherilyn, I'm, I'm also wondering, you know, whether or not these techniques give employers much more power than they used to over um, the people that they hire. What are you seeing? Well, I think the most important thing is to not treat um, these techniques uh, as though they are in some way disconnected from what we know about the reality of bias in employment or bias in law enforcement or all the other places that AI uh, is being used, and I, you know, the, the first and most important thing we should recognize is that we are late. We are already late to uh, ensuring that these techniques are embedded with what we already know about discrimination in this country. And this is my my kind of um, really concern in this space, which is that we treat AI as though it is the creation of some new world that is inherently impartial or that has the potential to be more impartial than other uh, things in our life. But you know, AI is created by human beings. Human beings are filled with biases. That there's no judgment in my saying that. That's just the reality. And the entire process of the second half of the 20th century, from Brown versus Board of Education on, was the process of figuring out how to manage those biases in ways that they do not inhibit the ability of uh, you know people from disfavored groups and particularly racial minorities from being able to participate fully in American life. So everything that we know about employment discrimination that we know from you know the Griggs versus Duke Power case in the 1970s, a case the organization I lead. Uh, litigated everything we know about, you know, tests. Remember when tests were supposed to be the thing that was going to be impartial, right? So it wasn't that you, you know, called your your best friend or your brother or your brother-in-law for the job, but everybody took the same test. And then we realized that tests had inherent biases, and that we had to look at whether or not a test was actually necessary for a job. Um, and then we think about, you know, what makes someone successful on a job, and who are the people who get access to the internships, and how do people apply online? How what communities have access to broadband? What communities have access to uh, the opportunity? to use online uh, materials. And then it goes even a step further. You know, you now have not only facial recognition technology, but uh, emotion recognition technology that we're hearing some employers are using in interviews, right? So looking at the face of an interviewee and trying to determine uh, what we see about that person and whether they will fit into the workplace. Um, but, you know, we have to underlay that with the reality that there is a, a wealth of data about the ways in which white people interpret the expressions of black people. We live in a segregated society, and so very often we don't know each other, or white people interpret the expressions of Asian American people. We know that this is a reality. So as we begin to see these technologies just taking off, and we're doing it in a space in which there really isn't a legal regime. I know we like to talk about ethics. Ethics is lovely. I'm a lawyer. I believe in ethics. Mm -hmm. You should, you know, govern yourself and all that stuff. But I actually like law because law is important. And these, these laws that we have in the, in the area of criminal justice, in the area of employment and so forth, were hard fought for. Uh, and, and they're useful. They're not, they're not um, inapplicable to this context, as you were suggesting. And so um, I'd like to see us really begin to speed up this process of understanding the importance of uh, you know, pulling back the mask and understanding that there's no such thing as imperfect impartiality so long as human beings are creating the product and to be uh, mature and rational about how we can figure out how to embed 
some of what we've learned um, into these products and provide a means of being able to challenge them because that's the trickiest part. You know, who, who's responsible when an algorithm kicked out the names, right? Is there, is, can we trace this back? Uh, if someone discriminates against you in promotion or discriminates you in get, against you in hiring, you know who that person is. You know the HR person you spoke with, you know the, the company, the company has policies and so forth. Um, but who's responsible for these algorithms? And are we simply embedding bias in a way that doesn't even allow us to get at it and understand how it works. And I think that's potentially quite dangerous. One of the things that um, I find striking about what you just said is that it feels like there's kind of a hunger um, for impartiality mm -hmm. and control um, you know, when we talk about things like, like AI mm -hmm. um, and, and testing and, and evaluation. Um, what are some of the, the tools we need to improve AI to make it more impartial um, or is that just a fool's errand? Well, I'll just say very briefly, I don't think it's a fool's errand to try and remove bias from uh, instruments that control people's lives. But I do think it begins with a recognition that there is bias, right? And so uh, if you don't begin in that space, if you, if you are beginning with the idea that you're going to be able to cleanse some technology created by human beings, um, you know, without recognizing that and if, unless we have fixed ourselves, you know, it's not going to work. Um, then I think it's problematic. And so I think beginning with the idea that, you know, there is bias, what have we learned from this in the context of human interactions and how can we apply that to the technologies that we're using to make sure that there are safeguards in place. Look, hopefully we're all working towards, and I know it's not all, but some of us are working towards a society that will become uh, more equal, that will become more humane, uh, in which we will, you know, not have uh, biases against each other, in it, or if we do, we will be able to recognize them and manage them. That's what I care about, is people being able to recognize and manage their bias. Um, and, and if we're all working towards that, then we should be working towards improving AI instruments to be able to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind me adding to that, just as a specific example, following, you know, like the previous regulations and the legal framework that's been around since, as you mentioned, like different kinds of tests, like you think of traditional tests you may have taken for an employment decision, like a personality test or an IQ test. The way that my company and the way that I'm approaching this, probably because coming from EEOC and having done many investigations of use of tests, I see algorithmic decisions very similarly. And I know there's been some really smart people in this field who have sort of challenged the approach that we could look at these things similarly. But in my day-to-day -day life, there's a decision that's made by the algorithm, just like there was a decision that was made by the IQ test, like Griggs you know, v. Duke Power from way, way back. There's a decision. Who does it affect? Does it affect people differentially? If it does, then there's a problem. And then at the very least, if you're looking at the regulations, you need to have some evidence that the assessment is actually working, that there's like actual evidence that the assessment is job related, mm -hmm. consistent with business necessity is the language. And so these are the laws. We have Title VII. We have the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures. This is what we have. And so I, I, w I agree that it's not perfect, because these were written a long time ago, but it still gives us a framework to look at outcomes. How is this affecting people who want jobs, who want promotions, who want better pay, better you know, work situations? I am of the mind that we should be using that same framework and just applying it to, OK, now there's an algorithm. And to your point about who's responsible, I, again, look at it in the same way that the traditional assessment tools were used. The responsible party is the employer who's, who's using this assessment device. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, vendors, like the vendor that I work for, are part of the, the scenario as well. And so vendors, employers, these are the responsible parties. It's not like an algorithm just sort of manifests itself <laughs> and then, above, you know, yeah. whatever. There's people, as you say, behind it. Those people should be held accountable. Can, can I just add one thing? Because we're actually, just this week, you may have read that the Trump administration, the Department of Justice, has um, been, you know, talking internally about trying to um, remove uh, uh, the use of the disparate impact standard, and that's really what was just being described, uh, which is such an important tool because I would think. Just it briefly, for those who don't yeah. know what the disparate impact standard. So is. the disparate impact standard, particularly let's say in the employment context, allows you to do just what was described. You have a particular practice that you use for hiring, and um, you know we, we can see that that practice produces a disparate 
impact, a disparate result, right? That the result of that is that no African Americans ever uh, pass this particular test or this particular instrument that you are using. That is supposed to be a signal to say, well, wait, wait a minute, what does that mean? Why is that disparity happening? Mm -hmm. And then we begin to probe why that disparity is happening. And one of the questions is, is that instrument actually, and this goes to your point, actually producing the information that I actually need that is necessary for my business for me to be able to identify who the proper people are to work here? So do I need it? Is there a business necessity for using this instrument? Because why would I use an instrument that actually excluded all people of one race if it wasn't actually necessary for my job. So if you're an ethical employer, actually that should matter to you. And in fact, if you want to comply with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, <laughs> that should matter to you. And so I think this is a really excellent point that this is precisely the moment in which the Trump administration is trying to get rid of disparate impact when in fact disparate impact is one of the most important tools that we have in the, in the employment context and housing and other areas, but particularly I think has the power to be incredibly useful in the AI field where essentially what you need to do is figure out how is this thing that you're using working? What is the re result it's producing? And then begin to work our way from there to understand whether there's bias embedded in the, the instrument. Yeah. Megan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think one of the main things to remember about AI is it's just recognizing patterns. Mm -hmm. And so if we know that there are biased patterns in society, anything we build is gonna recognize that. And so you have to approach it um, with that understanding and, and be active in making sure you're doing that type of testing. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a lot of interest in efficiency, there's a lot of interest in quick fixes, and thinking that if we just remove the sensitive features from um, a, an algorithm that's hiring people, if we just don't look at race or gender, then it's gonna be fine because we're not using those sensitive characteristics. But once we're looking at so much data, mm -hmm. There's a lot of data that's associated with those characteristics. Where you live, um, your behavior online could even be associated with your gender. And so you have to look at outcomes to understand if these tools are doing something that you don't want them to do. Even if you're a well-meaning vendor or a well-meaning employer who, who wants to be, um, who wants to hire fairly, who wants to increase diversity on, on their team, um, just removing those sensitive features isn't, isn't enough because artificial intelligence techniques, um, machine learning is powerful enough to find these patterns elsewhere. Mm. And so I, I, I agree wow. that the uh, disparate impact doctrine is incredibly important, and I think it's really powerful in the employment context. It's written into the law. In these other contexts, it's a little bit more voluntary. It's in regulations, um, but it's something that we should pay close attention to because it's going to be really important in making sure that other um, contexts where AI is used isn't having these impacts that are um, really moving us backwards. Mm. So don't uh, don't stick your head in the sand yeah. when, when it comes to AI. No, remember when fire departments, you know, you didn't have women firefighters because they had these height requirements. Well, it's not that there are no tall women, right? But it's that it, it, it you know, the, the, the height requirement tended to screen out, like all women, right at the beginning, before you ever had an interview, before you learned anything about them, before, right? So if we just kind of take that to the 10th power, and what you're describing really actually was just very uh, chilling, you know, about the way in which AI can actually look for patterns that we can't even imagine and think of. And I think in terms of testing, it's so important in employment and elsewhere, and the challenge with AI is can we still do testing in the same way we used to be able to? A really important part of testing for discrimination in employment is sending out resumes and seeing what you get back. Um, as you have all of these tools um, starting to parse through resumes, it's happening before people are even sending resumes. Mm -hmm. It's happening, you know, it's tests that are happening after you've maybe made it through the first process, um, but then you have to take some kind of online test or do an interview, um, which really raises the, the cost of doing that type of testing or makes it quite difficult to know what you should be testing in the first place. So I think it's definitely possible to do this type of testing as long as you know what you're looking for, as long as you know which tools an employer is using, which techniques an employer is using. And I think that's where it gets complicated with AI because that might be classified as a trade secret. That might be um, something that uh, an employer wants to keep a close hold on because they don't want people to game the system. Um, so we have to make sure that even as we're using these tools, that the laws that we have on the books that are, are you know, strong and we're, we're framed very well are still enforceable, are still testable. And I think um, that's something where more attention is needed. So um, we've got a great question here from the audience, um, Matthew asks, would implicit attitude tests work on exposing bias in AI, or are they only good for testing humans? Hmm. Uh, so my understanding of implicit, implicit attitudes tests is that they're developed for humans to take. So in case for anyone who's not familiar, it, it goes back to what we were hearing about before, that 
I mean, any well-meaning person, you believe that you don't have stereotypes, right? But it turns out that every human being, I mean, it's part of our ability to like think about things and our heads to not explode. <laughs> so you have a stereotype for like what a table is or what a chair is. I mean, this doesn't have to be necessarily related to human beings, but that that extends into how you think about people. So you might not realize it, but when you see a woman, like certain things occur to you. You know, when you see uh, an Asian American, certain things occur to you without realizing it. And so these implicit attitude tests uh, are a good way of testing that. And so I think it's an interesting question. If I understand it correctly, the question is, can you sort of like run an, an AI algorithm through an implicit attitudes test? It's, it's an interesting thing to think about. I think it's almost, I think sometimes general you know, folks approach this and think it's harder to figure out if an algorithm is biased than it really is. <laughs> it's actually not that hard to determine if you're following like a traditional approach. As I was saying before, everything has an outcome. Everything, you know, all these algorithms, they have a decision that they're making. And if you're running enough people through the algorithm, you can simply look. Is the algorithm pre you know, preferring men over women? It either is or it isn't. So it's not really like, that much harder, in, in my experience, to, <laughs> to determine if this algorithm is performing in a way that's unfair. And then if the algorithm is what I would call white box, meaning open, meaning you can look at it and see what the inputs are and how they're performing in the algorithm, then you can go a step further and say, it's this input. This input right here is the one that's causing the difference between men and women, for example. And then if the nice thing about algorithms, actually, is that there's so many inputs that you can afford to take that one out, that one that's causing the problem, and then look at it again. Is it still causing the same effect? You know, whatever the differences might be. And what's further nice about algorithms is that you can automate this process. Like, okay, check it. Okay, it's causing adverse impact, remove that thing, mm -hmm. check it again. And this can happen quickly, whereas like when we used to have to do this by hand, it was a slower process. Um, Pymetrics has actually open sourced our code, so anybody who knows Python can go to GitHub and look for Audit AI, and you can see the actual code for what I'm talking about. We're not the only ones. There's been some others who have open sourced this, but really it's, um, so I think it's an interesting idea, IAT, but I don't even think it's that necessary. I think it's, it's much clearer to me, having done, I used to do the statistics for cases where it was like an IQ test or a personality test when I was at EEOC, and my approach has been, there's no reason why we can't just <laughs> take it and look at algorithms the same way. Think, what, but what, you, what we really do need to do is look at the, the data that's being used to build these tools to mm -hmm. see if you can spot any problems there even before yeah. you build a yeah. tool. Like mm -hmm. if a company is using its um, assessment data to say to decide who's a high performing employee and who's a less high performing employee you should look at that data to see if that exhibits any disparities because if it does your 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 model's going to do the same thing and then if you remove those factors that are that are causing disparities in the algorithm you're going to end up with people who the company doesn't think are successful and then they're going to stop using that tool that is you know maybe a fairer process than they were using before so i think that you can use these techniques you can use data algorithms ai to spot issues within a company's own hiring process and really reflect on those before turning to a tool that's going to, you know, fix the the problem right there. I think this is a this is something that we have to look at throughout the life cycle of building these tools and not just in the tools themselves. And also think about how the people using these tools are understanding them. If a human recruiter is looking at a list of scores that maybe took a Pymetrics test or, or another test and they see that someone scored a 95% uh, match with the job and someone scored a 92% match, that might seem like a really dramatic difference even if in reality they would actually perform equally as well because the way that the company measures is really not so specific. It's just sort of on how do they do this year, pretty good or not so good, and not you know specific output numbers. And so I think um, another risk with using AI in this context and in others is that it it creates this um, illusion of, of specificity and accuracy that might end up having a powerful influence on a human decision maker mm. um, when you know you don't actually need so much specificity to achieve the outcome that you want as an employer or if you're looking in um, a context like criminal justice you know if you're if you're thinking about um, who should be granted bail or not, um, you're predicting how likely someone is to, to return for trial. If it says you're a you know, 52% chance, that might seem low or high. I'm not sure. You'd have to test how humans interpret that score. But that might not actually tell you much. That person might have 
a very close chance of someone who, who has a 70% chance of returning if you're looking at the actual outcome data. So you have to not only test the, the math of these tools, but also test them in the wild, see how people interpret them, how they use them. Mm -hmm. Are these tools making decisions on their own or are they informing people to really understand those outcomes and do the, and, and not only do the testing, but, but take the appropriate mm -hmm. uh, response to remedy any problems that you spot. So there's a really interesting tension that I'm detecting here, which is, um, you know, on the one hand, used properly, algorithms could potentially help the public keep employers more accountable because you actually can look at the outputs um, that were you know, generated by the algorithm as opposed to having to confront a human and you know, ask them to justify their behavior and all that. Um, on the other hand, that only works if you get to unpack the algorithm, right? So how do we make sure um, employers or, or large organizations, institutions, um, you know, actually are, are in a position to show us what they're doing with the algorithms. Do we need policies for that? Yeah, I mean, starting with the, the regulations that we have, you know, there is, there is precedent that employers are supposed to be, whether you're using an AI tool or any other kind of test, you're supposed to be collecting data so that you can test regularly the effect of that tool. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the same again. Mm -hmm. I think the part where, and then if there is a difference, you're supposed to search for a, a, le a less discriminatory alternative is the language. Um, and you're supposed to be documenting that the tool is job related and consistent with business necessity. Now, I think the thing that you're touching on is a little bit weedsier for one minute and 35 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's a really good question. Like, um, you know, I am lucky to work for an organization that, as I said, is a white box model. I know exactly the data that we're collecting. I know what it means. I have construct validity for it. I feel really good about what we're measuring, how it's job related. Now, there's lots of vendors in this space who do things like scraping the web and like just collecting passively, you know, uh, digital exhaust is like some language that folks use. So unpacking those like sort of maybe more like black box models where you can't quite make sense of what the inputs are it's possible that there may meet, you know, need to be sort of new policy, new regulations, uh, approaches for that, because I don't think it's quite clear. Yeah, I think there has to be. I mean, I think this is such a fraught space. You know, first of all, we've got two things that are juxtaposed, which is one that, you know, people get really nervous and anxious when you start talking about bias and they don't want to talk about it and they feel like you're personally attacking them and so there's all that anxiety. And then on the other hand, there's this like crazy Shangri-La Brigadoon conversation about AI <laughs> that makes people feel like this is just the, you know, this is tomorrow and this is so wonderful and these two things mash matching up. Uh, mashing up together, you know, operate in a space of avoidance. And so the first thing we need to do, and, and, you know, and particularly this is where the people who are writing about this and who are engaged in talking about this have to begin to talk about this reality and to stop talking about these AI instruments as though they're opening up some brave new world that doesn't carry with it all the problems of the old world. And so that's the beginning. The second piece is to understand that we have law for a reason. We don't have law and then you create something new and then like law doesn't matter. I mean, these are conversations that I have with Facebook and, and others as well. Um, we created this construct. This construct was created around a struggle. I mean, a, a really a life and death struggle for real people. And what happened in cases like Griggs versus, Griggs versus a Duke Power Company is that entire industries, in, you know, in those years, the textile industry, the steel industry, unions and so forth, opened up as a result of, of the laws that were imposed to produce precisely the, the regime that we're talking about right now. And that regime needs to be integrated into the use of these new instruments. I'm sure it has to be tweaked for all the reasons that you have so eloquently described and should be. And I think that's actually exciting to think about that. But the idea that it, it exists separate and a Apart from it, and so some some cases are going to actually, you know, that's going to what's going to happen, right? There's going to be some litigation, and that litigation is going to push us to the point of understanding that we have to integrate these two things. It shouldn't happen that way, but it will happen that way. Mm -hmm. Ran, any parting thoughts before we let you go? I think. You know, sometimes the outcomes are unsurprising, um, and sometimes they're surprising. And I think um, whoever the people who are building these tools need to be very aware of the context that they're working in. It, you know, uh, if you're a data scientist or a computer scientist, you're not just building a computer program; mm -hmm. you're um, introducing a product that's going to affect people's lives. And I think that. There's more cross-pollination that's needed between the tech community that are building these tools, the people that they're that are going to be impacted the tools, not just the users, not just to do user testing, but thinking sort of down the line, who's this going to affect? And then thinking about the regulators and policymakers to talk together about, you know, how do we update the the key laws that we have um, for this new context that isn't, you know, it's only speeding up. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a really fascinating discussion. I'm sorry we don't have more time. Um, but thank you for joining me. And uh, we're going to move on to our next session.
go ahead and start the work. Thank you for joining us again. All right. Hi, I'm uh, Drew Harwell. I'm a national technology reporter, and I cover AI for The Washington Post, so it's good to be here. Um, we're going to continue our program this morning with a conversation that touches a little bit on that, but um, sort of turns into how AI is impacting medicine and healthcare, uh, which I find really fascinating. Um, we're going to talk about some of the larger moral questions born out of the developments in the industry. Um, so please welcome Dr. Michael Abramoff. He is the founder and CEO of IDX Technologies. And Dr. Teresa Zayas Caban, she is the chief scientist at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. So thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. All right, uh, before we get started, I'm gonna remind you once again that uh, we are using the hashtag post live. Anybody who's watching this online, um, or in the audience can submit questions through that and we'll bring those up later in the discussion. So um, moving quickly into um, the topics here, and I wanna introduce you to both of these people because um, they're really fascinating and provide us a good outlook into this. Um, Dr. Abramoff, let's start with you, uh, CEO and co-founder of IDX. That's a practice which uses an autonomous AI diagnostic tool, uh, first of its kind to become FDA approved, so that's a pretty big deal. Also a practicing physician um, who saw patients yesterday, you just told me. So um, tell us a little bit about what the practice does and how it works. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I will start with saying, like I said, start a practicing physician, I'm a retinal specialist, meaning I see patients with retinal diseases, and many of these have diabetes. And diabetes happens to be the biggest cause of blindness in this country. About 25,000 people a year go blind. And we can treat it very well if it's called early and that's just not happening. So patient access is a big thing. And so what we did is create this autonomous AI when they found it, uh, IDX, eight years ago now, create an autonomous AI that makes a clinical decision by itself without any human oversight, someone like a physician like me overseeing it, making those diagnoses where the patients are, which is in primary care and retail clinics. And so you want an autonomous AI like that, well, then you get into patient safety issues because suddenly, there's no physician, no human overseeing what it does and what the diagnosis it makes. And so we as a company carry malpractice insurance because we will make errors just like doctors do. And so we carry the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And that started a long process with FDA and the relationship with the FDA has been, has been great because how do you prove that such a thing is safe? And now you get into clinical trials. How do you make sure there's no bias in the algorithm and the accuracy for different groups? We can talk about more, but I wanted to start with establishing that there is a, a dire need for autonomous AI to drive down costs, to improve quality, and very important, improve patient access where the patients are, that they don't have to come to me and make an appointment and wait three months to get that appointment. Sure, yeah, let's definitely get into that. And Dr. Zayas Kaban, uh, you're a, a, one of the chief scientists at ONC, and part of your job is to assess how federal agencies can work together to take advantage of emerging, emerging applications of new technology. What does that entail when it comes to AI? Um, so just to clarify, there's just the one chief scientist that, just the one. that I know of. Okay. Um, but um, our interest has really been um, in understanding what are the health IT infrastructure needs um, that uh, we need to address in order to support AI and what are the related data needs. So uh, the role of our office has really been focused on the implementation and adoption of health information technology. And most recently, we've shifted our focus to ensuring that the systems that have been implemented across doctor's offices and hospitals across the country talk to each other and interoperate. As you can imagine, the increased uh, digitization of health record has really created a resource that could be leveraged for artificial intelligence applications. And we've uh, delved into this topic in collaboration with the Robert Johnson Foundation and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, as well as other uh, federal colleagues to really understand what are the data needs? Uh, what are the standards needed to be able to make these data accessible um, and usable uh, for AI applications? That's great. Um, let's jump into talking about privacy. It's a huge deal when we talk about data. It's a huge deal with healthcare. Um, creating that proper infrastructure 
for data sharing, which is, of course, necessary to, to a lot of these techniques. Um, how do you think about medical and healthcare professionals, the need for them to protect patient privacy while also optimizing results? Well, for an AI, like for any, essentially any doctor, you need to have access to the data you need, the patient data you need, and you shouldn't have access to the patient data you don't need. And so it starts with that. Do I have a right or do I have a need for, for to, to see this information? And so that's the first protection you need. There's a whole interesting aspect specifically with AI because many times, like in our case, it uses machine learning. Machine learning uses data, specifically patient data, to become better mm -hmm. and, and to be shown safe. So now suddenly you're using patient data and, and you need to make sure that the privacy of these people is, uh, is, is guaranteed, essentially. And there's a lot of issues with that because Patients many times don't know that their data is being used to train an algorithm that a company like us is is is, is using. So you need to make sure that's very as transparent as possible. You know, there's a lot of laws and regulations around it, but we make sure that we are as transparent as we can be. Mm -hmm. But yes, very very important. And it's interesting because this is not a new topic, right? I mean, clinical trial, patient privacy. These have been issues we've been talking about for decades, right? But the the addition of algorithms and the you know amplification of AI being used to assess you know images and and uh, health scans like that. Are there new? You, you had mentioned uh, insurance and and malpractice insurance for using some of these. Are there new um, considerations when it comes to this kind of technology, or is it pretty much the same school of thought as we've been looking at for a long time? We've been thinking about this about traceability of the data sort of a farm-to-fork uh, model where a patient can know what happens to their data. And so we, one of the limitations is HIPAA, which typically doesn't allow you to do that. But it, it, it is, I think, good for patients to know what happens to their data, how it contributes to the AI, whether they want to contribute to the AI. You know, we have seen cases in the past where that didn't end so well. So we, we have a very good opportunity to do well, and we're trying to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We don't deal um, directly necessarily with the development of some of the privacy-related policies, but we do work collaboratively with um, colleagues in the Office for Civil Rights within the department, as well as uh, colleagues at the Food and Drug Administration, National Institutes of Health, who fund some of the research studies that would use some of the data to presumably, among other things, develop some of these AI applications. And um, the work that we are more closely involved with has to do with how do we attach things like consent and privacy um, preferences to the data in electronic form? How does that carry forward with the data? Um, how um, do we consent people into studies so they better understand how their data will be used and for what purpose? Informed consent, is that changing now that we're getting into this realm where a lot of people may not understand how these algorithms are being used? I mean, is there uh, a change in how we consider um, whether the patient really knows what they're getting into or what kind of techniques are being used? It's an interesting question. Um, the regulations haven't changed, but what uh, I've seen, and so primarily through a, a large program that NIH is leading under the Precision Medicine Initiative, the All of Us Research Program, they have been um, implementing consent uh, processes with teach back methodologies that were developed by a company called Sage Bionetworks to ensure that people actually do know what it is that they're consenting to. Now, this isn't it's for algorithms per se, it's for them to share their data, their health data specifically, to enable science and discovery. But there are models that could certainly be expanded and applied in the use of AI. Mm -hmm. Where do network smart devices and Apple Watches and wearables and all of these things that were at CES all week and have been a big part of the AI conversation, how do those fit into data sharing um, when we talk about healthcare? There's more for you, I think. <laughs> um, so that is a whole uh, other realm of issues, um, but an interesting uh, data source. And through the work that we funded, we found that a data source that could certainly be leveraged um, for health and health care. And a lot of people trying to understand how to do that, how to do that efficiently and effectively, um, and how to make it clear to people how their data are being used and shared. There's certainly a lot of work to be done in that space. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, yeah, do you? Yeah, I wanted to make a general point, which is that yeah. AI in healthcare, and especially autonomous AI, has such an enormous potential for cost savings, making quality better, 
and making patient access easier. And I, I worry a lot because I've been doing this for a long time about uh, a pushback because patients and people in general feel it's not being doing the right way, not in a safe way, not in an ethical way, not in, in, in an informed consent way. And so we need to be very transparent when we're introducing it. We need to focus on patient safety. We need to focus on transparency, be tra as transparent as we can be. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you will get a pushback, like you've seen in self-driving cars a while ago, and suddenly all these advantages cannot be achieved. Yeah. And so a very general point, but I think it's important to make. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And talking about self-driving cars and, and the ideas that they're being, you know, tested on public roads now, in the similar parallel of clinical trials, um, how can you conceive a, a clinical trial and carry it out uh, while sort of testing those applications for widespread use, but also sort of, um, you know, uh, optimizing for actual AI sort of um, applications for the medical community. How, how can you, um, you know, benefit both sides and, and clinical trials? Ha has that changed at all? It's not so much changed, it depends on how you want to do it. So. AI is not new, it has been done for decades in healthcare. You know, in the 60s they were making algorithms. It's the first time now, since last year, that, that we got FDA approval that the decision system is making a clinical decision without a human, that's new. And so patient safety is important and laboratory studies have shown that these, these systems work, but that's not the same as showing their work in a clinical environment, in a primary care clinic, in a retail setting, where people don't have much training for the retinal images that I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And so the AI needs to work in that environment. So it's very important that you test it and validate it as a system with the people in the primary care clinics, with the training in the primary care clinics, with a camera that's robotic and with the AI and even an assistive AI that helps the operator to get, take, in our case, good quality images. So you need to validate that. And that's the same as self-driving cars on a racetrack without pedestrians and, and kids running after a ball, that's one thing, but now you test it in the real world, that's very different. And it turns out that the results are different. And now you still need to be safe. And so it's so important to do the clinical trials right, in the right environment, with the right algorithms, and we can talk about that, but it's a different subject. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee patient safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it, in, in a sense, it's no different than any other clinical intervention where you do lab-based testing and validation. You do the same with health information technology system. You make sure the software runs, there's no bugs, but then you actually have to test it in, in context and see how it impacts clinical care, whether the workforce is prepared and adequately trained to use it, what impacts unexpected outcomes um, come from the interaction between the application and the delivery system. Mm -hmm. Uh, you may have noticed that there's a government shutdown going on. Um, uh, I think we're in day 20 or so. How has that affected your work or the medical regulatory community at large? My work, uh, personally, it has not. Um, we're open for business and working, and I'm grateful for that. And what about sort of, I mean, uh, on, on healthcare or research or? Um, I, I can't say broadly but a lot of the U.S. Department of Health and Sur Human Services is, is mm -hmm. working, so a lot of my federal colleagues are working. That's great. Um, I think we are starting to get some questions in, so keep mm -hmm. those coming. Um, I, I wanted to go sort of more into the ethical concerns um, that you had brought up. Uh, robots in the lab, robots in the clinic, in the hospital, are we seeing those being used um, more often now or operating on patients? What, what do you feel like is the near to midterm um, uh, priority for use of automated machines? So uh, just to take a step back, a lot of the, the interest um, or our interest in, in this topic came from the fact that um, more broadly, there's a lot of uh, increased interest in AI and a lot of progress has been made. Um, both because there's a lot more computational power to be able to run these algorithms and also because there's vast quantities of uh, high quality data that can be used to uh, both develop and test the algorithms and make sure they run. So um, we took a look at AI to see if sort of the time was right um, 
um, for us to, to see how it could be applied in, in healthcare and how it could improve quality, and it is, but a lot of the applications have been in image processing. So earlier there were some comments about sort of the, the gamut of AI applications and what that includes. A lot of the progress is, that has been made is in the space that Dr. Abramoff is in, which has to do with, with uh, images and how those um, get used and processed, so yeah. yeah. Dr. Abramoff, one question from Twitter, actually. Um, in the use of AI for identification of retinopathy, doesn't this raise the issue of accountability and malpractice? Absolutely, and, and so like I said, we have malpractice insurance, uh, and AI is not perfect, doctors are not perfect. The AI we use is better than me. I can say the FDA allows me to say that, <laughs> so it's better than me as a retinal special, fellowship trained retinal specialist. But uh, no, definitely that's an issue, and it will not be perfect. It will make errors. That will happen. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. We, you know, if you try to hide it, it's going to end up badly. So we need to be open about it. But studies show that physicians, ophthalmologists, trained ophthalmologists, have a sensitivity of about 30 to 70 percent. Uh, in this study, uh, the AI was much higher. Um, but how will that work? I mean, you know, thinking about liability when it comes to AI, who, who's ultimately responsible for when the AI gets something wrong or there's an AI rendered mistake? Is it the practitioner? Is it the, the technology developer? What, what's, the, what's the thinking on that? Well, we, 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 took a, we took a stand. We said we are responsible because we are autonomous AI. If you make an assistive AI, which many companies do, it assists me as a specialist but I'm still responsible for the clinical decision, so now you can sue me. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the, the physician didn't have the knowledge to, to make the diagnosis. It's a primary care physician, they don't have the expertise to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the AI is responsible, and therefore the company is responsible. Mm -hmm. I mean, litigation will show eventually how this goes, mm -hmm. but that's the stand we took. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you cannot say, well, it's autonomous, the AI makes the clinical decision, but we take our hands off and we don't, you know, let, let the, that, that is not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about AI investment in healthcare, uh, it's growing at a huge pace, uh, one billion industry-wide uh, as of last year. How can the industry maintain safety standards without quashing innovation, um, uh, especially as, you know, more private businesses and startups are, are cropping up to meet demand? Any thought on what the government can do or what the industry can do to foster that? I'd say uh, broadly um, what we found is um, uh, that standards for um, how these applications are developed, tested, um, as well as evaluated for safety are needed that are you know, made public and that um, different companies who develop these applications can use. Um, to sort of say, yes, my application passed this, this kind of standard. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a gap there that needs to be addressed. I see. Um, so yeah, please. Lots of, lots of people are looking at us. Can they make it work as a business model? Well, yes, we, we're starting to do that, so that's good. And why did it take them eight years? We started in 2010 with the FDA. Is it going to take me as a company with a new AI eight years also? And I have to say, we forged a path with FDA together to make sure it's safe, and how do you test it safe, and how you prove that algorithm doesn't have unexpected outcomes, explainable algorithms, very important, test it in the context where it's going to be used, primary care, and if you focus on all of that, it's very doable, it doesn't need to take eight years. You know, we are, okay, so we as a company are focused on bringing specialty care into AI and bring it to primary care and retail, and that's what we do, and we do it autonomously. There's lots of applications there that we're focusing on, but other companies are working on different things, different AI, different autonomous AI, but I definitely there's a path that you know shouldn't take as long as we did. Mm -hmm. There's no need for that. Mm -hmm. Every, we and the FDA had to learn from each other what is important, what is not important. And does the speed of that put the US or our industry at a competitive disadvantage, or do you need that kind of deliberate pace to make sure patients are being taken care of? You want to take it? Away? <laughs> and, and so it's right now it's an advantage. So again, I don't think it's an overburden. I think it's the right burden. Patient safety is huge because if we get a pushback, we lose all the advantages and the potential that we have, mm -hmm. A. And B, it's helping us abroad in Japan, in Europe. Everyone is looking at the FDA as the standard to achieve, and, and so the fact that we got FDA approval is helping us a lot in, in markets abroad. Mm -hmm. 
So um, what I would add is, uh, I can't speak to economic advantage or disadvantage um, globally, but in order for AI to be successful and to take hold in, in health and healthcare, these models are gonna require um, immense validation and that process needs to be transparent. They need to address an area of high significant need. They need to perform as well as, if not better than the existing standard, and have some sort of advantage, whether it's improved patient outcomes, reduce costs, improve efficiency. Um, otherwise, uh, what's the point? And so um, safety is very critical to ensure that these are successful and part of the testing process and all you need is for one um, system to cause harm for the tide to turn the other way. So it's really important that we be deliberate about how they're developed and tested. Yeah, is safety, you think, pretty much the most pressing concern for policymakers and regulators when it comes to healthcare and AI, or is there is there something else? I mean, are, are, are there specific pressing concerns that you feel like are? I mean, I'd say safety is a concern. The other one, as um, Dr. Abramoff alluded to, is this issue of explainable AI and making sure that uh, what the technology does is transpa as transparent as it can be mm -hmm. and can be replicated. Yeah. There's an additional aspect that we, we you know, we discussed with FDA and wh why we did the trial that we maybe did is that making an AI that has a good, a very good result on 10% of patients is relatively easier than one that achieves it in the vast majority of patients. And it was so important. It was actually, there's something called outcomes uh, that you look at in a, in a clinical trial and it's sensitivity, which is safety, specificity, which is effectiveness or cost savings, potential cost savings, but also imageability, meaning do you get a diagnostic result on the vast majority of patients? If not, if you only get it on 10, 15%, it's essentially useless. Mm -hmm. And so that's another standard that you need to meet, I think. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, um, I think we're sort of running out of time, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. And um, again, keep the questions coming in, and, and thank you again. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Kat Zakreski. I'm the anchor of our Technology 202 newsletter here at The Post, and I'm really excited to kick off the last panel of the day with you at our AI Transformers event. Um, we've got a great panel coming up where we'll talk a lot about the future of artificial intelligence and whether we're on a path to see robots surpass human intelligence and, and what some of the ethical implications of that could be. And so um, I'm excited to welcome our panelists um, we have Yibiao Zhao, who's the co-founder and CEO of IC, a startup developing humanist AI for self-driving cars. And we have Philippe Naxon, and he's an investor in AI and robotics technology, and he created the Robot of the Year competition. So thank you both so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And so just to kick things off, I mean, maybe um, could you tell us a little bit about IC and what the work you're doing is on humanistic AI, what that means? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, glad to be here. Um, so uh, at IC, we're working on the humanistic AI. So we know that there's a lot of companies uh, working in this space, but uh, most of the companies um, trying to help autonomous vehicles to see, but we know the seeing is not understanding, right? So um, as a human, we can, very good, we are very sensitive to understand other people's intention, understand other people's preference, or even emotions, right? We need to enable autonomous driving vehicles that be able to understand other human drivers in the environment, so, um, so that the cars can understand others and be able to collaborate with others well. Sometimes they also even need to negotiate with other human drivers when they need to interact or merge into a tight space. So that's what we're doing. Interesting, and I, I'm looking forward to digging into some of the ethical challenge that mm -hmm. that ethical challenges that that must present. And Philippe, um, can you tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing as an AI investor and, and what the Robot of the Year competition is? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yes, basically, the, the the objective was really to create an ecosystem that was uh, allowing to or promoting uh, positive innovations uh, for humans in AI and robotics. Um, so uh, the different sort of uh, approaches that were uh, taken um, by, by me and by, by my team 
was basically to set up a, an international competition called, as you said, the Robot of the Year, which elects the best innovations uh, positive for humans in AI and robotics, and so in 11 uh, industry sectors. And um, basically the, the objective was really to uh, promote those innovations by proposing then uh, some form of financing, which uh, is coming through the um, AI Van Fund, which is an impact fund, the first in Europe, um, and, and, and therefore sort of putting a, in place an ecosystem that really favors those innovations and having, giving them access to a, a different sort of level of expertise, which is a combination of different type of vision that we embrace within the, the panel of the Robot of the Year, involving uh, scientifics, uh, but also uh, philosophers, sociologists, and entrepreneurs, to give all, always like a very tangible prism in terms of how we approach ethics uh, when AI and, and robotics are concerned. And I just want to remind our audience here today um, that you can tweet questions um, to these panelists um, using the hashtag post live and, and also for viewers who are tuning in from home. And um, so along those lines, can you tell us a little bit about some of the companies that have won the Robot of the Year competition? Sure. Uh, we had actually the first edition at the end of last year in uh, Paris um, at that's Station F, which is a big incubator uh, located in the center of Paris. Uh, the winners of the competition were um, Wondercraft, which is a skeleton uh, a company creating skeletons or allowing paralyzed people to be able to walk. And the second prize was uh, a green culture, uh, an agriculture uh, robot, uh, basically uh, allowing farmers to uh, upload their, you know, the heavy uploads for, uh, from their day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, so we're, those were the two, uh, the two uh, uh, winners. And we've seen actually a lot of innovation, interesting enough, in um, environment, uh, healthcare, and education sectors. Um, there, those, those three sectors were actually the, the most prominent ones uh, within all the, the applica applications that we've had. And so along those lines, I think that it's you know, pretty obvious how we could see societal be benefits from an exoskeleton that paralyzed people could use or for technologies for farmers. But what about when those technologies could have unintended consequences? I mean, we know the Pentagon, too, is interested in exoskeleton mm -hmm. technology. So how do you weigh those concerns as you invest so, in this technology? So the, 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 um, first of all, the, the startups that want to apply for the Robot of the Year competition have to meet our 10 ethical criteria that are you know, embracing or uh, making even more, uh, giving highlighting the importance of privacy of data, pluralism of opinions, um, and, and the decision-taking uh, process as well, having all, always the human actually being the, on the forefront of the decision-making process. So we've got, uh, they've got to apply to the standard ethical criteria, and therefore that secures in some ways their intention to bypass uh, their initial thought about how they want to make their innovations evolve uh, in, a, in a moving forward. Um, and at the fund level, we have, uh, you know, sort of uh, financial terms that basically are preventing us or preventing them from, uh, you know, um, uh, choosing another path and, uh, you know, finding ways of applying those technologies for, for the bad reasons. Hmm. And that's also something you must deal with as you're trying to find ways to help machines think more like a human, as, as you explained to us earlier. Right. Um, how do you weigh those concerns? I mean, people talk about this idea of singularity where machine intelligence could surpass human intelligence. Do you worry about the risks of training machines to think in that way? Right. So as a computer scientist, I, <clears throat> I never worry about that at all. So I always consider that AI as a tool, right? So it likes other tools. Um, <clears throat> very interesting example is that decades ago, when we first invent washing machines or dishwashers, people also advertised that as the AI-enabled machines. Can you believe that? Um, and also, there's tons of media talk about the threat of the job, human jobs, right? So because at that time, there's a lot of people working on washing clothes for the others, washing dishes. Um, so, but now, today, we just think those are the tools, those are the dumb machines. We don't think those are the AIs. But for the autonomous driving cars, um, right now, we think, wow, that's scary, right? So the car can drive by itself. But uh, a decade later, I would say, our next generation, we think those are the same as the washing machines. Right? Those are the tools for human beings. So um, we're, we're used to that. 
And so can you talk a little bit about how, you know, there are a lot of ethical decisions that mm -hmm. we make every day and, and some right. that we really don't even think about consciously. Mm -hmm. right. So how do you pass that type of process on to a machine? Right. Uh, that's a very good question that people talk about um, the trolley problem, right? So whether the car will <clears throat> crash into the wall to kill the pedest um, people, passengers in the car, or uh, hit the other uh, pedestrians. So that's a hard decision. But what we're trying to do is to train an AI that can make a lot of micro um, trolley problems, like hard decisions. For example, <clears throat> should I slow down to let other people go first? Um, or should we just uh, signal to other people that I should go first, right? So do those problems so that we can prevent us to get into um, the, the same point that, that we have to make the hard trolley problem decision. Because when we get there, there's no good choice, right? What we can do is take time um, to prevent that to happen. Yeah. And from your sense right now, I, mean, I think we're in an interesting place where there are certain cities where you're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of testing of autonomous vehicles. Right. And mm -hmm. in Arizona, certainly, there's, right. there's been a lot of activity. And so how much do you think some of the bigger companies that have been out there really on the road so far, like Uber and um, Waymo, are, mm -hmm. are thinking about these types of decision-making processes? Yeah, so I think um, right now it's um, after some accidents, so definitely that's the common um, awareness that the safety of a Tom's vehicle is very important. And I see, um, I saw quite a few companies publish their safety report, and they hire dedicated people working on the safety side of the Tom's vehicles. Most of the companies, they have at least two safety drivers um, that can back, back up each other's. Um, so I think it's getting better. And Philippe, um, just looking generally at, at where we are right now with, when it comes to AI, we're increasingly hearing regulators talk about artificial intelligence. Um, in the US Congress, I, I know there's um, a caucus specifically focused on that. And just looking at where we are right now and the investments you're making, what involvement do you think um, legislative branches like the US Congress should have in um, the development of AI right now? Well, ethics is, is obviously one that needs to be completely embedded in the whole thinking process of how this technology should evolve. Um, there have been ino initiatives around the world that have you know, highlighted the importance of uh, making sure that we actually are putting the right sort of format in place to secure the future of humankind. Um, this has to be embedded by not only the Congress, but by any political you know, um, sort of uh, organizations around the world. And there have been initiatives from some of those countries more advanced than others, um, certainly sort of involving in that respect, as we said before, people with different levels of expertise, different type of expertise is, is essential. So uh, we see a lot of initiatives, you know, gathering only scientists um, and not only sort of involving as well as, you know, philosophers, uh, sociologists. Uh, and entrepreneurs, again, the importance of having a very pragmatic and tangible approach to those issues and to what me we mean by ethics is extremely important. Interesting. And on the point with um, self-driving cars and, and decision making, what role should regulators have in controlling that process down the line? Yeah, so I think that um, government eventually will play a very important role because the the decision that made in autonomous vehicles can be uh, very critical, right, to people's life. Um, and I think the currently the most important thing is tr to communicate on both sides, right? So the government have to be very clear about what's their intention, what they're trying to promote, and what's the guideline. At the same time, for the autonomous vehicles, companies also need to be relatively transparent to share what is the real um, problem was the real uh, um, like progress, so that we can understand each other and uh, decide this um, this agenda or uh, regulation like um, over the time. Yeah. And right now, I mean, we were talking about Arizona before, but it seems like there's really a patchwork environment in the mm -hmm. U.S. when it comes to regulation. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's impacting the rollout of this technology? Yeah, I think that's a good thing because we don't have a centralized. Okay, we do have centralized effort uh, to push the AV forward, but uh, 
the different states also have slightly different opinion. That also ref reflects the diversity um, of the public's opinion, right? So, and different states try different policies. I think that's what's also helpful in a way that um, we can see over time that what type of uh, regulation can actually really work and can really push um, the, um, the technology forward. But, uh, but our goal, like everyone I think in the space, is trying to make it happen, right? So no one's trying to prevent this to happen because we know there's the trend that uh, we cannot stop. Yeah. And so, Philippe, uh, talking about patchwork environments, it, it made me think of the competition that you run and how it was in Europe last year and is going to be in Singapore this year. And so when you're thinking about ethics and AI, what are some of the biggest cultural differences you see from country to country as you run this competition? I think that the privacy is probably the one that um, very sort of varies a lot from, from one continent to another or one country to the other. As you know, in Europe, we have, we have a, a motion which has been you know, voted and which protects you know, the, the, the privacy of, uh, of our data. But yet, you know, we also hear that there are different ways still to, uh, to go around that measure. So, uh, so I think that's, that's really, if I, if I was to, to sort of highlight one of the uh, main sort of uh, uh, issues that we face is probably data privacy. Uh, we've seen you know, the, the likes of the Facebook and so on um, dealing with those type of issues. And, and yet there's still a lot of work to be done in that respect. So in terms of cultural difference, probably you know, some of the countries are more advanced, as I said before, in terms of putting in place a regulation that actually helps us as, as users, end users, to be, uh, to be confident that our data are not spread uh, everywhere and used by, by parties that we would like them to, uh, you know, by parties that are not allowed to, to use them. Um, so yeah, that, that would be uh, the one that really strikes out of, uh, and separate from the regulatory environment, what do you think will be the biggest differences in the technologies that you consider this year as compared to last year now that you're going to a different area? I think healthcare is, is, has still a lot to, uh, to offer in terms of uh, innovations and then using AI and robotics. Um, and there we're seeing a lot of uh, innovations kicking off. You know, we, were, we had this discussion before, but uh, within the last two years, uh, we've seen a, a huge jump of uh, startups uh, you know, being created in AI and robotics. Um, probably more in AI and robotics, given that the hype around the notion of AI is probably increasing uh, by, by the day. But um, certainly healthcare is, is, is one sector that I see booming uh, for, for, for the next sort of couple of three years, yeah. And as an investor in this category, as we're seeing this boom in startups um, talking about AI, I mean, you don't have to look further than the headlines from CES this week to see how prevalent this has become. Yes. How are you cutting through the noise? Well, sort of, um, Basically, sort of using that vertical, uh, which is you know the competition, the robot of the year, which basically sets an environment, an ecosystem that really sort of orientate the debate and the way we would like those innovations to grow moving forward, help us you know getting to grip with what exactly is happening and how we can find ways of orientating those uh, those uh, uh, you know uh, exchanges and thinking around what ethics actually do mean for those uh, when we talk about AI and robotics. So this is this is our ways or our way or our approach actually to be part of the game and trying to again have this very pragmatic view and, and approach and, and vision as to what is really happening um, on the ground. Hmm. And in addition to healthcare, what are the other sectors that you're paying Education most attention to? Education and environment are probably the other two sectors that we see really growing fast. Um, and um, again, some of the projects that we see are not necessarily focusing on one specific sector but you'll find that um, those innovations have a, 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 an application across industries that is extremely interesting. We're working, for example, with a company that actually work on data privacy and the way our data is being managed and giving ownership to the end users as, you know, as, you know, as far as the data are concerned. And you can see that that implication has uh, a, a very positive impact on con the consumption of energy. Uh, you know, the use of servers by, you know, as a consequence will be much less and therefore the, the use of electricity was, will be much less. So, you know, examples like this are flourishing um, and it's really reassuring in some ways. We just, again, need to be extremely uh, coherent and careful of how we shape 
those, uh, this, uh, this environment uh, as and when we, we, we mention and we think about ethics. And I actually have a question here for you from Raj on Twitter. Um, he asked, are there common themes that appear among the submissions um, for the Robot of the Year competition? And you just mentioned education. Are, are there any implications from those themes for educators? Um, well, this, it's funny actually, it's just a wider sort of, uh, maybe the wider question would be um, just to, to see how much, you know, there's a big move towards um, social impact you know, as far as AI and robotics is concerned. Uh, we were not sort of um, expecting to see that many applications, certainly not for the first editions. And you, you can see that uh, in that sort of, you know, there's, there's a whole sort of new shift in, in, in sort of uh, the, the crowd that has been involved in AI and robotics towards anything that can have a really positive impact for humans. So uh, I think this is, this, trend is just going to grow uh, exponentially uh, in the coming years and, and in the coming months. And this is going to be, I think, a key evolution of how we see the, uh, uh, the progress of AI and robotics moving forward. And so as we talk about that key progress that's ha that you're seeing happen right now, we've also had a lot of coverage here at The Post about some of the short-term consequences of AI, um, coverage about things like deep fakes or other ways that AI can be misleading to the public. Um, when you think about some of the short-term problems that AI might cause, um, looking ahead to this year in 2019, what are you both most concerned about? Um. <clears throat> For me, I think, uh, like I mentioned, that um, AI is always be a tool, right? So uh, what matters is uh, who used the tool in what way, right? So <clears throat> I think a lot of initiatives about aesthetics is very important discussion to let people know wh where we can use the, the AI. And uh, <clears throat> like the current, the bigger concern is the privacy, the data, right? So like. Um, like deep fake that you mentioned that people use the data in the wrong places, right? And that can mislead in people. And I think how can we um, regularize uh, the data usage? And uh, those are the main things, I think. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. And, and also, again, given sort of the um, sort of reality check that we have uh, going through the vertical of the robot of the year and, 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 and within the ecosystem that we've built so far, we see, uh, we see that a lot of innovations are actually starting to address those, those issues and finding ways of uh, securing uh, the way we interact with, with some of those tools and, and securing the way we treat, it, informa we treat information um, and, um, and, and, and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it's very much like, uh, yes, there are issues. Obviously, there will be always be issues. But the more we advance in the process of creating those innovations and putting together those, innov those innovations, promoting them, uh, a lot, a lot of those innovations are actually addressing problems that are actually occurring now, and uh, and 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 I think this is going to be a moving sort of process uh, in the coming years. Um, you know, issue that will be identified will then be tackled by other innovations that will find a way to address those issues. Really interesting. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for our panel today. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for um, this session on AI transformers here at The Post. And you can um, catch up on the videos from all of today's panels on our website and look for information about future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.